begin talking about this passage on Wednesday and acknowledge right off the bat that it's, it's, a, it's one of those tough passages. Um, because on the surface, when we read it, if you just read the words of these two verses <clears throat> and don't really take them in their immediate and overall context of the book, <clears throat> it sounds like he's saying a little bit of wickedness and uh, a little bit of righteousness is the way we ought to live our lives. Don't be overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? And be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that will hold out your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. So we begin talking about <clears throat> these verses on Wednesday, and we initially recognized what the passage couldn't be saying on the basis of the fact that there are other passages that are super clear, that make it clear that he is not saying a little bit of righteousness and a little bit of wickedness. Don't, don't, don't be too righteous from the standpoint of don't try to do everything God wants you to do. Just do some of it. Um, and at the same time, don't, don't go to the other in, extreme and be too wicked. You could you know, just smatter a little bit here and there, and it's okay. Um, he can't be saying that because there are other passages we brought up First Peter and um, Leviticus, where we're told to be holy as God is holy. And God doesn't have a little bit of righteousness and a little bit of wickedness. He is completely righteous, and so we're called on to be completely righteous as he is righteous. That's how God wants us to live, not that we're going to reach that state of perfection in this life, <clears throat> but that's the goal. And so this idea of being a little righteous with a little wickedness is, is definitely not what he's saying. So we talked a little bit. Emily brought up the point that, you know, he connects being too righteous here with being too wise and made some points from the first chapter of this same book. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about the fact that perhaps the righteousness that he's referring to in this text is the idea of a, a self-righteousness um, and so <clears throat> what are some other thoughts because when we got ready to end class I said something about the fact that uh, we, we would probably go ahead and move forward and uh, it was suggested that there was still a lot in this verse to unpack so uh, I wanted to make sure we did that because it, I mean it is a difficult passage and the easy thing to do would be just to say um, okay we know this is not what it means, and <clears throat> just move on. But what is he saying? What is what is the point of this text in its context? Yes, sir. Well, the reason I was the one who said that last time was because <laughs> I was going to pick when on I was you. looking at. Well, I, I knew I had to follow through. I couldn't. I couldn't say that and not have any comment. Uh, because he says um, when when it's being overly righteous that you will not destroy yourself. That destroying yourself is translated either destroy yourself, I saw it translated ruining yourself, but another way it's translated is disappointing yourself. Okay. Um, that you might find yourself disappointed. And the, the verses immediately preceding it kind of talk about, in my mind, the brevity of life and how, you know, even if you're good, you might die prematurely. You might, you might live a short life and, um, you know, what, what good came of, in, in the voice of the preacher, what right. good came of your good deeds if you died so early. Right. Um, and so I wondered if there was another way of reading this passage where it's kind of a warning against um, living with an, in a, an inability to, to take action or living in fear of unright. Like you're so fearful of making a mistake that you never do anything or that you never take action and you will then ruin yourself or you will then see yourself disappointed in your life because you never did anything out of an abundance of caution or an abundance of righteousness or wisdom. Um, it may be bending the, it may be stretching the words a little bit. I, I will acknowledge that. I found comparison to Galatians chapter 5 where to me in that passage he's warning against, uh, Paul is warning the Galatians against righteousness just for the sake of, well we've got to, let's, let's keep circumcision of the law just in case we leave something out. It's 
seemed like the attitude there was, you know, yes, we're Christian, but let's add on these other things and let's be extra, extra careful that we don't miss anything. And Paul says to them, you're doing this out of just the fear of, of tripping up and you're doing this for appearances sake. And that's sort of the, the point Emily was making too, doing it just for the sake of appearance. And, and he says, you're, you're kidding yourselves with that mentality. You're not serving God out of a, a spirit of wanting to serve God. You're not, you're not uh, emotionally invested in that. It's just a fear of messing up. And so you're being overly righteous and ruining yourselves. I'm trying to, uh, I was trying, trying to listen as you were talking about this and making your point. And trying to wrestle with the text, and so I may be kind of rushing to judgment, but I, I don't I don't know that it's bending the words. Your your idea, uh, at least on, as far as I can tell, on just with the like I said, a surface, and I haven't had a chance to think about it quite as much as you have. But in thinking about the overall context of this particular passage, what you said fits really well. Because, I mean, there is the contrast just before it in verse 15 of, you know, there's a righteous man who dies prematurely in his righteousness, and there's a wicked man who prolongs his life in his wickedness. <clears throat> and so, you know, we could go to either extreme. Um, we, we, could, we, we could decide to, to, to be overly righteous in the ways that the Pharisees were with all of the problems that arise from that. You know, we strain at a camel and... Or we're straining strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. That's the way the passage goes. Um, or we could say, well, the, I mean, these, these wicked people are prolonging their life in wickedness. Let's just throw ourselves completely into wickedness. And, and so, I, I don't know. I, I think about what you've said in the overall context of the passage, and I think it fits pretty well that we could be too cautious in our righteousness to where we essentially are paralyzed and do nothing. I was also um, trying to find, I can't remember the, the letter that references the asceticism. Yeah, it's, uh, it's Colossians 2. So the, the ones who deprive themselves, they, they <coughs> beat themselves up and they, they abuse themselves in the flesh and are overly self-depriving out of without this desire to either appear or they think they need to do it to be righteous. And that's, that's also condemned in the New Testament where, you know, you, you don't need to have no enjoyment of life and right. you don't need to deprive yourself of the things life has to offer to be a Christian. Um, now, that's not the same as saying there's no such thing as right and wrong and there's no right. such thing as righteous behavior for a Christian. But I just think there's a harmony between Ecclesiastes and this passage just as a, maybe another way of framing that overly righteousness. Because it, it, it certainly does seem like on a cursory reading, he's saying just sprinkle a little sin and you'll have a better life. And that's that's, right. I agree, that's not the point. Right. And <clears throat> you, the, what you were just saying at the end with the Colossians passage, Colossians 2 is the passage he was talking about, I think. Uh, yeah. Uh, beginning in verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive to the world or in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used. According to human precepts and teachings, um, they have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Um, and so, really, if we, if we boil these two things down, who is the one in, in the passage in Ephesians, and it's also true, I think, in Galatians and Colossians, who is the one determining what is right and what is wrong in those passages? Who are the ones that came up with the asceticism, the idea of starving yourself of any human pleasure at all, because that's going to be the way to avoid sin? Who came up with that? God or man? Clearly man. Um, whose, whose righteousness was the one who said, well, we're going to tithe mandamus and kum, but we're going to forget about justice and mercy and love, and, and therefore we're going to strain out a gnat and swallow a camel? Whose righteousness was that? God's or man's? Man's. So, in, I mean, when we look at, uh, this has been true, this is not a new thing in Ecclesiastes. From the very beginning, when we talked about the fact that we were to be careful that we didn't make wisdom the goal of our life, 
Whose wisdom are we talking about? God's or man's? Man's. <clears throat> so it's not surprising that in Ecclesiastes 7, 16 and 17, the focal point of who is determining what is righteous and what is wicked is who? I mean, if we're using God's righteousness, is there anything bad about God's righteousness? Is there any part of that that we should neglect or leave out? Is there any of that that we should say, well, you know what, I think uh, that, that sounds okay, but I think it might be better to do it this way. What is that when we do it our way instead of God's way? It's deception, but it's adding or taking away. Adding or taking away. Presumption. Presumption. What else, though? Let's just call it what it is. Sin. It's sin. When we do things our way instead of God's way, we know what God's way is. And we say, eh, you know, that, that looks like it would be okay, but look, I, I think I could do it this way and it would be okay. That, that's putting your will above God's, which is sinful. Um, even if it's not sin, if you know what God said and you choose to do what you want instead of what God said, it's sinful. I mean, that's the bottom line. So all of God's righteousness is good, but when we determine... These are good things for me to do, and this is how I ought to live, and I'm going to fill my life up with this, and I'm going to make sure I parade this around for everybody to see how good and how righteous I am. And then we say, well, these things are all bad, and I'm going to avoid them at all costs. I'm not going to touch them at all. And that's fine. It's okay for you to hedge things up. There are things that I do in my life that I recognize that are judgment calls that I've determined are things I ought to avoid to keep myself from being placed in an area of temptation and the potential for sin. That's okay, right? I mean, I think it is. I hope it is. I've, I've been doing it for a while now. <clears throat> what is not okay for me to do? Equating that with that's God's, that's God's righteousness. Yeah, so... He's saying that that should be universal with everyone. So then Andrew chooses to do something different. I'm just picking on Andrew. Um, Emily chooses to do something different than what I do than the judgments I've made, than the way that I've chosen to hedge my life. And I look at Emily and I say, oh, what a sinner. She's just such a horrible, horrible person not walking with God. And it's, you know, it's one thing if I think that, it's, that's bad enough. I shouldn't even do that. But it's another thing if I start, start either talking to Emily about it and making her feel bad about herself because she doesn't see it the same way that I do, or I talk about her to other people, and try to, try to run her down to make myself and my position bolster it and make myself feel better about it. Those things, what happens to people who do that? Ecclesiastes 7, 17. They ruin themselves. They ruin themselves. Um, what was the other? Uh, or they, they will be disappointed. They will be disappointed. So that, that, that's a little different rendering or reading. And it does fit very well with the, the idea of what you were talking about. I don't think it's inconsistent with the text, but it is, in my mind, is a little different than the idea of being disappointed myself is internal, right? Uh, I'm disappointed in me or disappointed in the fact that I can't be as righteous as I think I should be. Um, but ruining myself could be either from the standpoint of internal, I view myself as being ruined, or external other people um, don't want to have anything to do with me so <clears throat> it's one thing to to hem your life in or to hedge your life to keep yourself within the confines of the will of god it's another thing to parade that around which is what the pharisees again did i mean they built these hedges that's okay if you want to hedge your life because you recognize the areas you're weak in and you don't want to to even be tempted with the possibility of sinning against God, that's fine. But they weren't content with that. They wanted to build that those hedges on, onto the level of being the word of God. This is God's law. And then teach that to everybody else so that everybody else would walk in it. And that is overly righteous. <clears throat> and uh, and it, it leads to all kinds of issues both in our relationship with God, but in our relationships with other people too. Um, so I, I don't know, like I said, I'm just, I was trying to think through what Andrew was saying and I, I really was trying to listen to what he was saying and, and, and think about the context in this passage. I don't know that it's a stretch. And, uh, it may be 
it, it may be the major point that he's trying to make in this text. And I would just invite you, it's a, it's a tough passage, I would just invite you to think on it a little more and um, we'll, we'll, we'll be studying this passage again at some point uh, in the future, Lord willing, and we'll, we'll have an opportunity to talk about it again. We may change our minds. But um, uh, I, I, do, I do think that's helpful in recognizing, and I do think it's, I do think it's re- it, it is good for us to recognize that throughout the book, when he points to something as not necessarily being something we should make the focal point of our lives, typically it is man's wisdom or man's righteousness or what man considers to be wicked. <clears throat> Because I may consider some things to be bad or bad judgment or a bad idea that God has not determined are wicked or sinful. And again, it's okay for me to avoid those for myself. It's not okay for me to label them as sin. Because if God hasn't labeled it as sin, it's not, it's not sin. Yes, sir. <coughs> and maybe just one more lesson to take from this is, is the exact thing he says in verse 18. Don't just focus on one of these warnings without focusing on the other. Yes. Um, so someone reads both of these and they say, don't be excessively righteous. Well, that, that's impossible. And then they read, don't be excessively wicked. Okay, I'll do that one. <laughs> and he's, he's writing exactly to that person saying, it's good that you're saying I'm not going to be excessively wicked, but don't just discard the notion that you could be overly righteous in your own mind. Well, and the interesting thing is, okay, so... In 16, be not overly righteous and don't make yourself too wise, okay? Then in 17, be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. I'm, I'm going to ask you, of those four things, which one stands out as being rendered differently? Overly ri- righteous and overly wicked, those two fit pretty, th- those are, those those have a similar structure, right? They use the same adverb even. What about too wise? Is too wise similar to, could you have said overly wise? And use the same adverb there? And it would still be consistent? But which one's not the same structure? Don't be, doesn't say overly foolish. The fool. Don't be a fool. It's a denier of God. So if you deny God, there's no degrees of yeah. denying God. Yeah, but, but it is interesting that the structure's different, and I think the reason goes back to what Andrew was saying, and, and that is this idea of, <clears throat> you look at, well, don't be overly righteous, oh, well, okay, I can't do that anyway, but don't be overly wicked, oh, I can handle that one, that's, that's perfect. And he's saying, don't be a fool. <laughs> that's not the point at all. Um, the, the cursory reading of this text is not the point. The, the point is, to recognize that there is a righteousness that man has or that man thinks on that is not the righteousness of God. And there is a wickedness that man may identify as wicked that's not the wickedness that God has identified. And so don't, don't, don't give yourself over to either one of these. Live your lives before God. And I mean, that's going to be the theme of this book. <clears throat> I mean, he even says it here in verse 18. It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand, for the one who does what? Fears God shall come out from both of them. So it's again about fearing God, and that again is the theme of this book. We're seeking the wisdom that comes from God, not the wisdom of men, um, not the righteousness that comes from man. We're not avoiding the wickedness that man identifies as wicked. We're, we're, we're striving to live the way God wants us to live. And so the key is fearing God and keep his commandments. Yes, sir, Jim. Yeah, I'll give you a verse. And I mean, and that's, I mean, that is, that is the point. Um, God, God is true and everything God says is true. Um, and every man falls short of the will of God. And therefore, as Romans identifies us, we're all liars. Um, we're, we're, we're striving to be um, something ultimately that we're not. And that doesn't mean stop striving for it. Um, but we're, we're not perfect. We're, we're not God. But we're striving to be like God and. 
Thanks be to God that even though we still struggle with wickedness and sin in our walk with him, um, in his grace, he provides forgiveness and redemption and reconciliation. So, okay, anything else about those verses? I appreciate Andrew uh, putting, my, uh, putting, putting us to that passage a little bit more. I think we thanks, probably thanks got us, things out of our thanks for letting us linger there. Didn't before. What? Thanks for letting us linger there. Well, I appreciate it. I, I mean, like I said, I think we, I think we probably pulled, pulled a little more, unpacked a little more from those verses than, than uh, what we did on Wednesday night. And uh, it was, was helpful to me to take a, a different look at it. Um, and uh, to have a chance to think about it a little bit more. So, appreciate that. Um, okay, anything, let's see, there, there was one more question. Near the end of this chapter, um, he talks about the, the idea of, do not, verse 21, take all the things that people say to, do, do not take to heart all the things people say, um, and, and why shouldn't we do that? And there are multiple reasons. I think he has... Well, I can probably learn from that one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take everything people say about you to heart. Because some of it might not be true at all. Oh, okay. You I mean, fixate on it and th think th that it is. There are multiple ways to deal with this passage. In the context, what's the reason? Or what are some of the reasons that are given? I want to talk about what Samantha said a little bit more because I think that's important. <laughs> But, but what are some of the reasons given in the context for not taking to heart all that people say about you? Yes, sir. One of them is you, you probably said some things that weren't very complimentary of other people. Okay. You've been guilty of saying things about other people uh, that weren't very complimentary as well. So, so, uh, Can you read the actual verse, Grace? Because I think this is something I, I just read, I read maybe yesterday. Can you read it? Yeah, 21. Do not take to heart all the things that people say. Lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. And that's the point Greg made just now. Is that we, we're we guilty of saying things about other people too. And uh, <clears throat> I, I guess the question becomes, do you always mean everything you say? I know we should. That's not the question. The question is, do you always mean everything you say? No, we say things when we're hurt or when we're angry. Well, I think, um, too, something that, I, I that thought about not. with this is it, um, it allows us to be gracious with other people who do say things that are to be said. Yes. Remembering that we've done the same thing at some point or another. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, a, a recognition of the fact that we, we've done the same thing um, and, and therefore shouldn't be overly critical of my NET bubbles having trouble coming up this morning. <laughs> But um, the request timed out. I'm on Wi-Fi. What were you wanting to read? I was just wanted to read verse 21. It says, uh, also do not pay attention to everything that people say. Otherwise, you might even hear your servant cursing you. And, and then 22. Uh, for you know that in your own heart, you have also cursed others many times. Okay, so pretty similar s structure to the way the ESV renders it. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so we're guilty of the same thing. So, so be careful about taking to heart, um, everything that's said about you. But I, I do want to talk about what Samantha said a little bit, because I do think that's important. I don't know that it's necessarily, um, in this particular context, but it is a, a biblical idea. Paul even deals with it himself. Um, not only are we guilty of doing the same thing, we, we've already recognized the fact that we don't always say what we mean. So sometimes when we're hurt or angry, we'll say things about other people that we may not necessarily even believe ourselves. Um, we're just mad or we're just hurt. And uh, most of us have done that. I, I won't lump everybody in, but I, I know I'm guilty of it. Um, so most of us have done that at some point, and therefore we should recognize that someone else might do that too. But that, and that kind of lends itself to the point Samantha was making, and that is people will say things. Does that necessarily make it true? No. I mean, is the word of man the gospel? Is the word of man inspired by God? No. Um, and that's it's kind of a point that Paul makes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 
Um, he, he said when he when he talks about the idea that um, it, even if he's judged by another man, that's really not a big not not a big thing to him. Um, he even goes on to say, "I don't even judge myself." Um, does that mean Paul doesn't discern or think about his conduct and decide whether what he was doing was right or wrong? And is that what he's saying? No, but but is he the ultimate judge for whether or not he stands righteous before God? No. Or is anybody else? Any any person that's alive, are they the ones who stand? God's they're, they're bending God's ear, and ultimately God's going to be like, well, you don't think Paul's worthy. I guess he's not worthy. And so that's the end of that story. No. And, and so the, the point is just that people do say things that are not right. Um, and, and that doesn't just mean that they're things that shouldn't be said. People say things that are not even true. So people may make statements about you. Your, your worth, who you are, your person is not determined by what other people say about you. Um, it's ultimately determined by what God knows about you. And so that's an, an important thing for us to understand and to consider. Does that necessarily make the comments that people make about us or the things that they say hurt less? No, and I mean, I think, again, that, that's okay for us to recognize that it, it still hurts. But we, we need to give consideration to the fact that ultimately it doesn't determine who I am. Should, does that mean I should be unconcerned with what people think or say? And I think that's another important point for us to understand is that him saying this doesn't mean, well, just don't worry about what other people think about you. Don't, don't worry about what other people say about you. It's not important. Because it is. Um, and we know that because there are multiple passages in Scripture that deal with the idea of people watching us so that they might ultimately know who God is and glorify God, that we can glorify God in our conduct. Our example is a, a powerful influence on other people. Greg? I think it's an encouragement to use discretion and common sense about how you give regard to other people. Right. There are people in Columbus and elsewhere, I have very little regard for what they say right. about me because I've read it in print. I've read it in newspapers. I've seen what other people have said about me. And I have to use judgment to say they don't know my heart. They right. don't know me. They don't know what I meant when I did this or that. And so I just have to be conscious to say, I'm just going to forget I heard that. I mean, I think the admonition is not only is it better not to get worked up about it, sometimes it's better not to hear it. <laughs> don't even go out, well, what are people saying about me? What, right. what, did I, what did that mean? What did that person say about me to you? Right. Don't ask those kind of questions because in the context of what it was said, you don't know whether they were flipping with it or whether they were very serious or whether it bothered them, whether they're disappointed. You don't know any of that stuff. So not only is it good judgment to say that person's opinion is of no regard to me. Right. It's also I don't even need to hear about right. it. There were days when the newspaper showed up at our door and, and there were sections cut out of the paper. <laughs> and the only one that seen that paper was my wife. <laughs> and she took the scissors and I said, how come there's holes in my paper? And she said, you know, things, you you didn't, <laughs> things you didn't need to see. Um, <laughs> just another reason to love that woman. <laughs> she was watching out for you. Um, and, but you're right. I mean, the, the reality is that uh, they're, they're not only do we not need to take it to heart, there are times that we just don't even need to hear. And sometimes we put ourselves in, in, in that position um, and shouldn't because we, we hear that somebody said something and we want to know what it is. And it's like, as Greg said, we know it. I mean, we, we know who they are. We know how they typically feel about us. It, it's probably not constructive or helpful. So why do you even care to hear it? Um, and so we need to be careful about that aspect of it too. But I do think it's important. He says, don't take it to heart. <clears throat> does that mean, I mean, assuming we hear it in the first place, does that mean we shouldn't even consider it? 
I mean, because, you know, even a blind squirrel finds a nut every now and then. So maybe this guy that has it out for you occasionally might. But I mean, not, not that you go looking for it if he's always, um, always running you down and just looking for a reason to criticize. But the reality is that there might be occasions where even the person that, that, that uh, is, is overly critical might bring up something that other people recognize too and, and could be helpful. So when we do hear it, uh, the point is it, it might be worth considering. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to take it to heart and, and get all worked up about it and do anything about it. Jim. Yeah, and I mean, and Jesus even talks about the fact that for every idle word, we will, we will do what? We'll be judged. We will give an account. Um, so what you say matters. I mean, uh, don't, don't want anyone to misunderstand and to think, well, yeah, other people say things they shouldn't say. And we've, we've Ecclesiastes is saying we do the same thing. So it, it's really just not that big a deal. I mean, word, words matter. What you say matters. Um, words have power. The old saying I've said before that we used to always say on the playground, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is a bald-faced lie that we try to tell ourselves to make ourselves feel better about how bad it hurt when somebody said something bad about us or mean about us. Words do hurt. Um, they may not hurt the same way sticks and stones hurt. Uh, they hurt emotionally instead of physically, but the reality is <laughs> sometimes that pain's worse. Um, if we're being honest with ourselves and uh, maybe it's high time we recognize the, the, the power of the psychological and um, our structure and all that we have to deal with on a daily basis instead of just dismissing it as um, some kind of pseudoscience. Yes, sir. I, I said recently that you find the balance between being thick skinned and callous. Yes. You want to find that middle road words when they are useful can still penetrate the heart correct but on the other hand um, don't take everything to heart right so that's where i go to again the idea of being being careful to decide right. what it is that makes you feel the way you feel right and you get to choose that that takes practice and that takes experience <coughs> but uh, grace you can't make me feel in any way that i don't want to feel by whatever you say about me. I choose how I feel about what you say about me. It, we, uh, we, uh, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's important for us to, to recognize it, there are a lot of things that are really easy to say. Um, just what Greg just said about the importance of being thick skinned but not calloused. Um, that's, a, that's a good illustration for the point that we're trying to, to, to or that Ecclesiastes is trying to make here. And it's really easy to say that, and it sounds like, well, yeah, that's simple for you to say. It is easy to say. It is difficult. Um, it, it's, it's more difficult to put in practice and to, to actually do it. And Greg even talked about the fact that it takes, it takes wisdom and experience and time to develop that. It's not like, I mean, I guess there, there may be some sense in which some of us are more thick-skinned than others just naturally. Um, although maybe you've just developed it over time. <clears throat> but it, it, is a, it is a skill you can learn um, if you're willing to, to, to do the exercise and the, the, to put, out, put forth the effort. Joyce. Right. Even if they're true, he's not hurting himself. Yeah, and, and I mean that's that's true. We we ultimately can't hurt others without hurting ourselves, and we may not always recognize it, and it may not be evident uh, to us or to the other person. But that that is that is true. Um, being the wrong kind of person, saying unkind things about other people, is harmful 
not only for them or to them, but it's harmful to us too. Joy. Uh, Joy. And then Samantha. <clears throat> so this is mostly um, to uh, reinforce this to myself. And that is, so I'm saying it publicly, I hope you can hold me accountable, is that God in this verse is giving us permission to set a boundary. Um, and just like I think it was um, Greg that said, I get to choose. There are people who believe or have been taught that they have no choices on anything um, and, and therefore no boundaries. But this is one of those verses that shows that God expects you to set that boundary and to um, make yourself profitable for yourself and for to him. Yeah, and uh, I mean, we always have a choice. There's some sense in which, though, we could say um, if our choice is to follow God, there are certain things that we don't really have an option about, I, I guess would be the way to put it. I mean, we still always have the option. We can choose not to do what God wants us to do. But the bottom line is there are some choices that are made when we make that first choice to follow God. And so there may be things that we would prefer um, uh, or uh, that we would pre prefer to do or prefer not to do, but God says we should do something different. And if our choice is to follow God, then that other choice has already been made. And so uh, I do think it's important for us to recognize that while we still have a choice, um, that, that, that choice ultimately should be to do what God wants. Yes. Um, so... Yeah, and I mean, you know, I've, I've made the point before, even even my nine-year-old now, but I mean, for, for a long time, she's had the ability to make her own choices. I mean, she, she's, and, and you know, I, we, we like to think as parents that we have the power to control what our children do, and I, I might be physically big enough and strong enough to make her do whatever I want her to do. I could take her by the hand and force her to do something. But she still has a choice, and if I mean, she she may in her mind say, I, "I'm not going to do that," and I might be big enough to to force her to do it. But I still haven't I still haven't have have not gotten the obedience that I'm seeking after, and so she has a choice, and that choice at times may be to disobey what Ashley and I tell her to do, or ask her to do. Um, but but she has the ability to make those choices now. Choices always have what? They always have consequences. There is always an effect to the cause, <clears throat> but um, it doesn't change the fact that she has the right to choose for herself what she ought to do. And I, I shouldn't, I, I, I should encourage early on the fact that she has her own power to choose. Now, what do I want her to choose? Ultimately. I want her to do what I ask her to do or what I tell her to do. Um, our, our, our kids get those confused. Instead of being commanding and demanding something, we a lot of times will ask, well, uh, would you go pick up your plate uh, and, and put it in the dishwasher? And they, they hear question, and what do they immediately think? It's an option. <laughs> I've got choices. Which they do have a choice, um, which is part of the point that we're making. But is it really an option in this case? Are we going to take, I mean, that's like when ben, Benjamin was really young, he, I used to get a kick out of the fact that I think, I mean, he might have been like two. 
he would, uh, we got a kick out of the fact that when he didn't want to do something, he would say, no, thank you. Well, that's very polite, son, but this really wasn't an option. I mean, but that, I mean, he thought, well, if I say no, thank you, then that's okay. Because I'm, I'm being polite and everything's good. No, uh, no, no, no wasn't the option we were looking for here. We wanted you to do it. And, and that's what we try to tell our, we, we want them to do what we say. Why? Because we're in charge and we're the boss. You think that's why I want my daughter to do what I ask? I hope not. If you do, then I've, I've got a bad image. What is my aim? My aim ultimately, as Joy said, is heaven. Um, it's not about her obeying me. It's about her learning a proper respect and understanding of authority in whatever form that it takes, whether it's a, a parent in the home, a teacher in a classroom, a police officer out on the highway, <clears throat> but ultimately it's all pointing back to the recognition that she should recognize the authority that God has to instruct her and to give her direction in her life, and she should want to choose that option because it ultimately is for her good. And so I'm trying to mold and develop that attitude from a young age. I haven't always done a perfect job or a, a great job of it, but that's the goal. Samantha, you had something six so hours ago. I want to go back to what Craig was saying about, you know, you have like a choice to feel the way that you do, which, which is true. That doesn't mean that what somebody said didn't hurt you or didn't make you angry or whatever, but once you feel those things, you are responsible in dealing with those feelings. And I've had people get mad at me before when I've told them that. Yes. Like, yeah, so-and-so may have hurt you, but you're still responsible for dealing with those feelings. They get mad at me about that because it's easier to blame someone else. And yes. in my opinion, people like that want to stay where they are. They don't want to. It's easier to blame someone else for their own misery when in reality they're responsible for that because they've let it go on and on and on and <clears> not really do anything. Yeah, we live in a society of victims, and the, the, the problem with that is, I'm not being overly critical, the problem with that is that if we're not careful, we begin to have some of those same mentalities. Because as Samantha said, it's much easier to blame somebody else. I'm not responsible for what I did or for what I said, because you did this. And so we want to be quick to point the finger at somebody else. They're responsible for the way that I responded or the way that I acted. And that is never true. The devil made me do it. It, it, the devil may have influenced it. He may have encouraged it. But the devil can't make you do anything. Um, and nobody else can either. There's some sense in what Samantha said is true. How we are initially feel about what somebody does or says, how that initially impacts us, there's not a whole lot I can do. Emotions from that standpoint are very reactive. But what we are responsible for is what we do with those emotions. It makes us sad. Well, what are you going to do about that? How are you going to respond? You're going to respond in kind. You're going to consider what they said and take to, take to heart the things that are true and, and make modification. Um, what are you going to do about it? Uh, you, the, what they said initially, uh, I got really angry about. Well, what did you do with that? Did you respond in kind or did you deal with it appropriately? That part we're responsible for, and, and we must be responsible for, and they can't, unless we give them that power, they, they have no power to, to, to make us do anything with those things. So, okay. I think we've exhausted seven to my satisfaction at least. If that's not the case for you, um, then you can bring that up on Wednesday night and we'll talk about whatever's left in this chapter that you think we need to. Otherwise, we will begin chapter 8. And, and I mean that. If there's something in 7 that you're like, well, we just passed over that, and I would like to talk about that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Andrew's not the only one who gets that privilege. Anybody in this class can have it. And uh, so, um, because I mean, typically if somebody brings something up like that, it's, it's, it's helpful to more than just one of us. And so uh, make sure you make that known on Wednesday night. And otherwise, we'll move on to chapter 8 and continue in this text. Appreciate your help this morning. Yes, ma'am.